The Department of Neuroscience sponsors Brainstorms because it's an outgrowth of our belief that as a world-class uh, Department of Neuroscience, it's, it's one of our responsibilities to be good citizens in our community. And so we want to reach out to you and, and share our passion with you about neuroscience and neuroscience research. We, we want to answer your questions. And you may not believe this, we learn a lot from listening to your questions. And so uh, the, the, uh, the word conversation is in bra uh, brainstorms for a reason. We, we see it as a conversation where we learn from you, you learn from us. And so that's what we're going to uh, be about uh, the whole season. So this is the, our 19th brainstorms, first one, third season. So thank you for keeping coming and so we can keep doing this. It's our second season here in the LBJ Auditorium, so thank you for that too. So let me, let me just uh, tell you a little bit about the format, Internet, uh, introduce the speaker and we'll, we'll get going. So um, we're, gonna, uh, we're gonna listen to our speaker talk for about 45, 50 minutes. Uh, when he's done, I'm gonna pop back up here. We have a panel of three more uh, UT faculty and, and PhDs and we're gonna uh, spend the rest of the night answering as many of your questions as we can. Uh, we'll go over this again, but uh, you may notice that those of the you brainstorms aficionados, we've skipped the three by five cards this year. We've joined the 21st century. So during the Q&A, we've got microphones set up that you can come up and ask a question. We'll also pop a, a phone number on the screen up here. You'll be able to text questions, 21st century. Um, <laughs> Our panelists are gonna be, uh, those questions are gonna be popping up on the computer screens of the panelists, and just like they did before, they're gonna, they're gonna look for the, the ones that, uh, that they can best answer, and we'll do it that way. Uh, if we, as I suspect, are still have lots of questions as we're nearing the end, we'll do the brainstorms uh, usual that the last 10 minutes or so, we'll do lightning round, as I like to call it, which is, You'll have 30 seconds to ask your question. The UT faculty member will have 20 seconds to answer and we'll try to pound through as many questions as we can, okay? Sound okay? So for me, for me personally, th this is a, a, a special night. It's fun that we're here for the third season, the Brave and Storms and the, and the audiences are as big as they've ever been, so that's fun. Uh, it, it, it's fun because this is the first brainstorms that we've invited a speaker from outside of UT. It's fun for me because he's an old colleague and a great friend, uh, Jim Kinnearum. Uh, Jim and I overlapped for, throw something out, 10 years, 12 years, fair amount of time. We were together, I was there when little baby Jim was a brand new assistant professor. At, we were at the UT Med School in Houston for a long time together and then somewhere along the way he, he went off to Hopkins and I, and I came here. He's still a close friend, he's still a great scientist, and I knew that he would be the right person to start us off. The reason, uh, one of the reasons I thought of Jim is that, uh, as you may remember, this is the 50th anniversary of the, of the landing, the Apollo 11 landing on the moon. Uh, the dean of the College of Natural Sciences, Paul Goldbart, encouraged us to find ways throughout this year to mix into our presentations and such things about the space program to honor the fact that there were so many UT people, engineers and such that were a part of that. As soon as he said that in the, in the chair's council meeting, I knew that our first speaker of the year ha had to be Jim. So um, Jim is one of the world's authorities on the hippocampus in spatial nav navigation. Uh, he's, he, uh, he'll, he'll kick me for saying this, in many ways, he's revolutionized his field and has been has gone from that little little baby Jim assistant professor to really really a leader in his field. And so, uh, the the scientists here tonight know that this is a real treat to have somebody like Jim here. So uh, please help me welcome my coll old colleague and good friend, Dr. Jim Kinnearum. Special guest lecturer. <laughs> Go ahead. It's, it's okay. It's always good to get your audience laughing at the beginning, and this is this is a, a good setup. 
Thanks, Mike, for that uh, great introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here and to uh, have the opportunity to, uh, to talk about some of the work that we did, especially, as Mike's mentioned, uh, this project we did um, many years ago uh, about the uh, uh, space shuttle, and we did some uh, really interesting neurophysiology experiments up, up in space, and I'll, I'll uh, weave that into our talk. Uh, the title, you're probably all scratching your heads. You know, what are we talking about? Navigation, memory, and weightlessness. They all don't seem to have much to do with each other. And we're going to take sort of a, a navigating, kind of meandering path, touching on these three uh, topics here. And hopefully by the end of the talk, uh, you'll see why I, I put them all together. So I'm going to start out talking uh, a story about uh, a man named Henry Molaison. Um, Anyone who has taken any introductory psychology class or an introduction to neuroscience class uh, in college uh, knows HM, uh, probably the most famous neurological case study uh, patient in, in the history of, of, of neuropsychiatry, uh, such that when he died about 10 years ago, uh, his obituary was on the front page of the New York Times. Uh, what made HM uh, so uh, important to the field of, of memory research uh, was that uh, it's just a, a, an amazing story of, of how uh, a surgical operation that he underwent had unintended consequences that basically opened up the whole field of understanding how human memory works. So uh, we'd, he would go in by the patient HM because at the time before he, he passed away, he was only known by his initials. And when he did pass away, uh, his name was finally uh, revealed. So uh, Henry Molaison was in... Uh, when he was a young man, uh, he suffered an accident and uh, had some brain damage and started getting epileptic seizures uh, for his whole life after that. Uh, uh, when he was about 26 years old or so, these seizures were so severe, so frequent, he had multiple grand mal seizures every day. It was a life-threatening situation. This was in the 1950s. They didn't have the same kind of medication we have today. Uh, he was resistant to any treatments they had. So as a last resort, uh, basically, the surgeons... Uh, knowing where in the brain the epileptic seizure started, uh, did a frankly experimental procedure, and they removed on both sides of his brain uh, a, a certain a, a area called the hippocampus. And uh, the surgery was very successful in relieving his epilepsy, but it had the unknown and devastating consequence that from that moment on, uh, this man never had another memory of anything that happened to his life from that moment onward. So, um, uh, so the question became, well, uh, what, what happened? So this is Henry uh, before his surgery as a young man in his mid-20s. And about, here's another picture of him about 20 years later. Uh, between the surgery and 20 years later, he could not tell you anything that had happened to him in his whole life experience from that point onward. His general intelligence was fine. You could have a conversation with him. You would come meet him for the first time, and you would ask him, how are you doing? I'd talk about the weather, talk about what his, what his day has been like. You'd have no real indication that something was wrong with him. His IQ was fine. He could talk perfectly fine. But if you were to leave the room and come back five minutes later, he would have absolutely no recollection about having seen you before, having met you before. So there was something about the part of the brain that was removed that seemed to be required to form new memories. His memory of his experience his life before the surgery was mostly intact, but he couldn't form any new memories from that moment onward in his life. He died when he was about uh, in his 80s, and at the same time, you know, that whole, he, he, it, he never recovered from this condition. So by the end of this talk, I'm going to have uh, hopefully three answers to questions for you. One, first question is, where in the brain does memory for the past events of your life reside? Where in the brain does your sense of location and space, your so-called inner GPS, your, your global positioning system inside your head, where does that reside? And what's the relationship between memory and your inner GPS, your so-called cognitive map? So this is the part of the brain that uh, the surgeons removed in uh, HM's brain. And since then, people, uh, we, we've known there are other people who have had stroke to this part of the brain and other uh, uh, encephalitis and so forth whose damage and, and have replicated the same kind of effects of, of memory that HM had. Uh, this is just a cutaway brain uh, of a brain. And what, what you see in this gross dissection is this curved structure here uh, deep in so the, the medial temporal lobes. This is the part of the brain, kind of right be, be, uh, behind your ears in, the, in this part of the brain. And it's called the hippocampus because when it's removed, it looks like this. And uh, early anatomists thought it looked kind of like a seahorse. And 
I think it's quite resembling. And seahorse uh, basically comes from the, uh, an ancient mythological creature, half fish, half horse, called the hippocamp. So basically this is where the, the structure gets its name, the hippocampus. And this is the part of the brain that the surgeons removed uh, in HM. Uh, if anyone's seen the movie Memento, it was a very popular movie probably 15, 20 years ago. Uh, and if you know this movie, this lead character, uh, Lenny, uh, if you, it, he basically has an amnesic syndrome uh, that basically is the same thing that HM has. So uh, uh, the inability to form any new long-lasting memory. So uh, you could have a conversation and keep something in mind for the 30 seconds or so, maybe a minute or two, necessary to carry on a conversation. But once you get distracted or something else happens, it's gone. And, and you have to have this, the, 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 you, you cannot remember any of those, uh, uh, any, any part of, of that uh, conversation. So the first case reports of HM's uh, uh, surgery and, and uh, surprising unexpected memory deficit came out in the 1950s. And after that was reported, scientists began to investigate how the hippocampus contributes to memory and why is it so crucial to form new long-term memories. And one thing that scientists started to do was to record uh, from neurons in, in, in the brain uh, using mostly uh, laboratory animals. So this is a cross-section of what's called of the hippocampus in a rat brain. These are the location where the cell bodies, the neurons, reside. Uh, and then here's just a, a, a microwire uh, electrode that can be inserted into the brain. Uh, this is a tiny wire. It's about you know, the thickness of, of a human hair. So we're talking really extremely fine microwires uh, that can be implanted under surgical anesthesia, of course, uh, into the, uh, the uh, brains of animals. And if you put the tip electrode right in this uh, layer of all these brain cells in the hippocampus, the question is, what do they do? And I'm going to show a movie now which uh, shows the uh, uh, firing of one of these uh, hippocampal neurons as this animal, a rat, runs around in an environment. Uh, this is, I, I grabbed this from uh, YouTube from a researcher uh, named uh, Roddy Greaves. So this is an overhead view of an animal, of a rat. He's going to stop moving around. Now what you're hearing, that's not just a bad audio noise here, okay? That's the firing of individual neurons in this rat hippocampus. So see if you can figure out what the cell likes. What makes the cell go crazy and fire these, uh, these action potentials, as they're called? It's silent now. The cell's not active. It's not doing anything. Still not doing anything. Oh, there was a little burst. Anyone have an idea of what seems to be the correlate of the cells firing? What's that? It fires whenever the rat was in a certain location in that box. So uh, I, I don't have the screen anymore, but uh, for example, in, in a situation like this, we could have an animal walking around this box here, and that cell would fire whenever the animal was at this location in the box and was silent elsewhere. And here are some recordings from my lab, uh, just replicating this phenomenon, which was discovered in uh, the early 1970s uh, by John O'Keefe uh, and Jonathan Dostrovsky at University College in London. Uh, O'Keefe recently won the Nobel Prize for discovering these cells. He called them play cells. So uh, what we're showing here is just a, uh, uh, an image that shows uh, the floor of this box here. And it's got this single white polarizing cue card. Uh, Blue means these are locations where the rat ran around, the cell was silent, and red means locations where the cell was highly active. So the cell we just heard a video of would have looked something like this. It was active whenever the rat was up at this uh, northern location in the box and silent elsewhere. But other cells would be firing at the south part of the box along this wall or along this wall here. Some cells fired when the rat was in the middle of the box. So these cells, uh, O'Keefe called them place cells. They seem to encode or represent the physical location of the animal in an environment. So O'Keefe basically, uh, along with Lynn Nadell, published a book in 1978 in which they proposed that the hippocampus 
was the, the basis of what they call the cognitive map, using an old term in, in psychology that had been proposed uh, many years earlier. Uh, and the, th the idea is that we all have in our heads these cognitive maps, these mental representations of where we are in the world. I grew up in New York City, and there's a famous cover from the New Yorker back in the 1970s. This is the typical cognitive map of a New Yorker. <laughs> I'll guarantee you this is exactly how New Yorkers view the world. <laughs> Ninth Avenue, 10th Avenue, lots of detail about what, what is out there, different buildings and so forth. Uh, then you go to the Hudson River, and there's New Jersey, and then you know, everything else. I think Texas, there's, there's Texas, okay? <laughs> and it makes sense, okay? You know, you have an, a, a representation of the things that are important to you. And the, the idea is we have this map of, the, of our world, and we populate this map with things that are out there in the world. And this is how we represent our environment. It's how we represent where we are, how we get from one place to the other, and, and so forth. And we tend to be biased uh, about uh, making higher representations, more detailed representations of things that are important to us. And of course, nothing's more important to New Yorkers than New York. Don't laugh too hard, because you Texans are no different. <laughs> So the question becomes, how does the brain generate this map? How do we generate in our heads a representation of where we are in space, where we are in an environment? If you're in your house, you know, how do you get from your living room to your bedroom? If you're on, on the campus of UT Austin, how do you get from one building to the next? How are you going to get back to your car now to drive home? You all have in your heads these mental maps of where you are in this physical environment, and the brain has to create this. So how does it do that? So I want to take a poll right now. If you think you have a good sense of direction, raise your hand. If you think you've got a lousy sense of direction, raise your hand. If you think that's a trick question, raise your hand. <laughs> Why is it a trick question? Hmm? What's that? It's different inside or outside. Do we have a sense of direction? When you were in, in, in third grade, learned science class, did you learn about the sense of taste, smell, touch, vision, and direction? <laughs> no, we don't have a sense of direction. We talk about a sense of direction, but it's not like we have eyes that sense the visual world or ears that can sense the auditory world. Our, quote, sense of direction is something that the brain has to construct itself. Just from, from the different senses, it has to do these computations in the head. It has to do processing to actually derive what we colloquially call a sense of direction. And how does it do that? Well, not only a sense of direction, but the sense of position, the sense of where you are in space, your cognitive map, is something that we have to, uh, the brain has to create based on uh, the sensory input. And it was actually Charles Darwin who is generally credited with the idea that maybe animals calculate how they are, where they are in space, how they update in their own heads where they are in their own map, uh, the same way sailors for centuries would do it on the high seas. They would do a, a process called dead reckoning. So what does that mean? So the pilot of the ship, the captain, would have these charts. And in the wide open ocean, there are no landmarks there. All they can see is just you know, blue water as far as the eye can see. But they need to know where they are as they get, progress across the ocean. How do they do that? Well, every half hour or so, they would just take a measurement. So they would start, OK, they knew where they were when they, when they left the port. And every half hour or so, they would take a speed measurement. They would have a knotted rope and put it from the front of the boat. And the boat would go forward. And they would see, as the, as the uh, rope unfurls, how many knots went by. And they could measure how long that would took, you know, what, what the, they could estimate their speed. And then they would have a compass, and they could estimate the direction. So by, if, if they knew what direction they were headed, and over uh, the past half hour they said, we've been going at this speed, they would estimate, we must have traveled this distance from our last measurement. And they chart on the, plot on their chart here the distance and direction from their last measurement. And each half hour they would just put on this chart, update where they were. And then, this was not highly accurate, but then every so often as they sail along, they would see an, an island in the, in, the, in the distance. And oh, we weren't expecting to come across that island for another two hours. And then they would say, okay, well, we're going to correct ourselves on this chart. So this interaction between what's called this dead reckoning 
uh, we call it path integration in the animal literature, uh, that this is how they would keep track, at least an estimate of where they were on the oceans um, moment by moment, and then would use visual landmarks out there, islands or other uh, uh, plots of land that you could see on their maps to then basically correct any error that might have accumulated over the course of time between sightings of land. So as I mentioned before, uh, Darwin suggested that you know, maybe this is how animals navigate. This is how they build up their own cognitive maps by doing a very similar uh, computation in their brain. And over years, uh, a lot of research has been developing to suggest that indeed, that's not the only thing animals do. Navigation is very complicated. There are many different ways of doing it, but one important way is indeed uh, the same procedure. Uh, and we know this now just by many different recordings of brain areas uh, that are similar to what I showed you earlier about the play cells. Another very famous cell is called the grid cell. Uh, this was discovered uh, 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 in a lab of, of my Britain, Edward Moser in Norway, who basically shared the Nobel Prize with John O'Keefe, I mentioned earlier, for this discovery. Unlike a place cell, which I showed you before, uh, which fires in a single location, this is another representation of a rat running in a square environment. And I showed you before place cells that would fire in one location. Well, here you can actually see a representation. This is the black squiggles is the trajectory of a rat running through this environment. And the red dots are locations where the rat was whenever that cell fired a spike and actually potentially, that, you know, that pop, 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 pop that, I heard, that you heard in the earlier video. It sounded like static. And you notice these cells don't fire in a single location. They're firing in many different spots. But when you look at it, they're arranged in this amazing hexagonal grid-like structure, or, or something that's called a, a hexagonal grid or, or a triangular grid. This is a very crystalline type of a structure, uh, firing pattern. When, when this came out, people didn't believe it. They said, this has to be wrong. You know, how can the brain fire in this, in this beautifully geometric, precise way? Uh, but it's been replicated many times, uh, and, and, and it's real. And, and we kind of think that this is sort of like, the, they call it a grid cell. It's like a grid on a map. It's like a coordinate frame. This is like the, the map, the, the, the structure of the map before you start putting any information on it, like landmarks or other things. And nearby, there's another cell. It's called a head direction cell. This was discovered by James Ronk uh, in the 1980s, many years ago. Uh, now this is the same representation as this, but now the, it's, the, the, it's a circular environment. And you can see there's lots of red and green and, and very little blue anywhere. So this, this is not a cell that cares about location. But when Ronk plotted how the cell fires as a function of the direction the rat's head was pointing, it had this very sharp tuning curve. This cell fired only when the rat's head was pointing in this northwestern direction. It's not a geomagnetic compass, you know, because you could, you could change the orientation of this thing relative to the to Earth's gra uh, uh, um, uh, magnetic field, but in this environment, it cared about when the head was pointing in this direction. And we think it serves the same purpose as the compass did for the navigator on the high seas. So we have like the, the, the framework, the, the grid chart of a map. We have the compass here. We have other cells that fire when the animal is along a boundary of the environment. We think this helps to keep this framework and the compass aligned to the world. And there are also cells that encode the speed of movement. So there seems to be all the components that the brain has that the navigators in the, in the, on the ships have that allows it to do this, this dead reckoning computation. And that works great when you are on a horizontal, two-dimensional environment. But there's a problem when you go to three dimensions. And the problem is that movement in three dimensions is not commutative. In other words, in two dimensions, or if I were here and I just make a, a right turn and a left turn, I'm facing this direction. But if I make a left turn, then a right turn, I'm still facing the same direction. That's what I mean by the commutative property. Again, go back to your high school algebra, right? A, pl a plus B equals B plus A, OK? But that's not true in three-dimensional movement. And here's an, a, a, a figure I took from a review paper by Kate Jeffrey, where I'm showing this little rubber ducky here. But the rubber duck starts out at this direction and rolls to the left, a roll, pitches up, 
and then does a yaw turn. So these are the three axes of, of, of movement in 3D. Uh, so this is yaw, this is roll, this is pitch. So the duck starts out that way, does a, a, a roll, a pitch, and a yaw, and now it's facing upwards. But from that same starting point, if you reverse the order, you pitch, then you yaw, then you roll, well, now it's facing a different direction. So keeping track of your movements and your orientation in three dimensions is much more complicated and a much harder thing for the brain to keep track of. And the problem is then uh, that this has serious consequences when you are trying to navigate in 3D. And our brains were not, did not evolve to navigate in 3D. We mostly just navigate on two-dimensional surfaces. Yeah, we climb trees sometimes and we climb stairs and all, but we're always keeping our head stable and, and trying to keep track of where we are in, in, in the different depth axes, but still trying to keep track of our, our, our movements in, in, in our orientation in, in, in 2D. But pilots, though, for example, you know, they do navigate in 3D. And uh, I hear from people who are pilots, uh, uh, you know, you have to be trained to navigate by your instruments if you have poor visibility. Uh, one other uh, uh, scientist colleague of mine who, who is a pilot told me there's the, the saying that uh, uh, in the pilot, pilots is that if you are uh, trying to navigate by just keeping track of your own position by yourself and not using your instruments in dense fog where you can't see anything, you have a life expectancy of about five minutes. Because it's so easy to get disoriented as you, as you, you just, you, your brain, we just cannot keep track of ourselves and, and, and we think we're flying straight, but instead you could be flying right into the ground. So very serious consequences for pilots. Now we're talking about, now, now the weightlessness comes in. Now we're talking, this is why, where, where NASA comes in. Uh, in zero gravity, astronauts have the same problem. They have, it, it's, it's very difficult for them now, even worse than a pilot, at least a pilot is still sitting down trying to keep the plane level. When you are in a weightless environment, you are free to move any way you want. And astronauts actually have uh, some pretty severe uh, spatial disorientation effects, especially early on in, the, in their space, uh, in their experience when they get into orbit. So what kind of things, do, uh, what kinds of problems do they have? Well, they experience some very uh, clear visual illusions. One thing is called the inversion illusion. Astronauts, when they get into in the space shuttle, say, they get into our orbit, they're in orbit within like eight minutes of liftoff. And many times they have this feeling that they can't shake, that they're upside down. You can imagine how really disturbing that would be if you just felt for, the, for 24, 48, 72 hours, constantly, you just felt upside down. Uh, there's something about not having that gravitational framework that, that they just feel, you know, it, it's not like they're upside down or they can change. They just feel that they're spending all their life upside down and it takes a while for them to, to recover from that. They have things called visual reorientation illusions. Uh, so this is where, if you imagine you're, you're, you're an astronaut, they're trained in the, uh, in, on, on Earth in an environment that looks just like the, the space lab environment and it has floors and ceilings and they actually try to keep themselves oriented by that. Because what happens is they can stop playing around. If they start to, in, in zero G, pitch themselves backwards for about, up until about their uh, the 45 degree angle from, from the quote ceiling, they still feel like they're going uh, upwards against uh, that the floor is still below them. But as they get to about 45 degrees, now suddenly they, they, they experience a, a reorientation effect. Where now suddenly the ceiling is the floor and they now feel that they have just flipped their orientation. And many of them report, as soon as that happens, they suddenly have this vague sense of unfamiliarity where they are. The environment just doesn't look the same anymore. Of course, they know they're still in the space lab and all, but they just have this visceral sense that they don't quite recognize where they are anymore. This, this, re, this reorientation effect, as the ceiling now becomes the floor, uh, has, has, has altered their perception of, of, of where they are in, in the space lab. Uh, that goes away after usually a couple of days, and then actually, at first it's very disturbing to them, but then after a while they apparently get kind of have, have fun with it. They try to actually play around, oh, oh can I flip this, can I flip that, and, and, and their, their time off. But they certainly have these uh, effects early on. 
uh, the idea of a subjective vertical. So that's what, what eventually happens is that they perceive to be the floor wherever their feet is. So they can make the feet, you know, what would be the floor on the, on the, on the earth-based lab, but they can tilt backwards and then suddenly the, the ceiling becomes the floor. Or they could go this way and now the wall becomes the floor. So wherever their feet are, they kind of learn to use that as a reference point and that's, and that's the, 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 the floor. So in the early 1990s, the first President Bush uh, declared the 1990s to be the decade of the brain. And uh, a lot of resources went to try to understand how the brain works. And NASA created what's called the Neuralab Space Shuttle Mission, which is dedicated to brain research. So we basically uh, uh, applied for, uh, uh, put in a grant, I was a postdoctoral research fellow at the time, uh, to try to understand with, with the hippocampus with these place cells and so, uh, that I had mentioned before about how they may be affected uh, as animals uh, navigate in the zero G environment. So we created, here is one of our astro rats. Uh, we created a, an environment, uh, a track that would allow the animal to navigate in 3D. So, on this one surface here, the rat would be moving along here, would make a, a, a left turn uh, in yaw, would pitch backwards to now start walking on this surface, make another yaw turn, would go back here and pitch again to go to this uh, final surface and come back to where it started. So uh, this reminded us of the famous paintings by M.C. Escher. Uh, <laughs> so we, we started calling this the Escher staircase experiment. The interesting thing about this is that after the rat does this procedure where it can change uh, its, it, its uh, or orientation in yaw and pitch in 3D space, it can walk along this track, having gone 190 degree return, a second, and a third, and it's back where it started from. But it's only completed 270 degrees of turn in this yaw axis. Whereas, of course, on Earth, the animal would have to complete that fourth 90 degree return to be able to be back at the same location, starting point. So there's going to be a conflict between the rat's internal reckoning system, this dead reckoning uh, system I mentioned before, and all the visual landmarks that were out there. And we thought that this discrepancy between the internal sense of where the animal was and the external cues uh, might disrupt the firing of these cells. So this is our group at the time. Here, I was a much younger person than that. This is the baby face that Mike was telling you about. <laughs> and this was uh, Bruce McNaughton was my boss at the time, and uh, Carol Barnes, and they're the ones who actually ran the experiment. Gina Poe was another postdoctoral fellow who was, worked with me on, on running this project. And this is our team. We're at t minus 20 uh, at Cape Canaveral at this moment we took this picture. And then here are the real heroes experiment. This is the crew of the NeuroLab, uh, who uh, I spent many hours training, especially these two gentlemen and these two here, uh, to run our experiments up in space. They wouldn't let me go on the space shuttle. I don't know. <laughs> so we had to train the astronaut crew, the real, the real uh, uh, brave people, who basically strapped themselves in to the shuttle on top of this bomb. <laughs> um, and I'm going to show you now, for the next few minutes, a, a, a video uh, which showed us what we found in this experiment. T minus 10 seconds. Nine, eight, seven. Go from eight engine start. Six, five, four, three, two, one. And liftoff of Space Shuttle Columbia on a mission expanding our knowledge and understanding of the human nervous system. This is 1998. Roger roll, Columbia. Columbia into the roll, placing the shuttle in a heads down, wings level position for the eight and a half minute ride to orbit. This is the space shuttle Columbia, the first space shuttle that NASA ever built. And, and uh, unfortunately, as five many of you, I'm sure, are aware, uh, uh, tragically disintegrated altitude, about five or six years range. after this in its re entry to, uh, to Earth, and all the astronauts on board were killed at the time. A terrible story. Really um, so, about eight minutes uh, after. Uh, the liftoff, uh, the astronauts were in space, and we had to wait four days for our experiment to take place. What we're showing here, I'm sure the, the video quality is not so good here, I'm afraid, but uh, what you can see here is this is our rat now on the fourth day of flight navigating on our Escher staircase in zero gravity. The rat's just grabbing onto this track and pulling itself along, and it's getting rewarded uh, by, by moving along the track. 
And uh, every so often you'll, you'll just see the, the colored LEDs on the head is how we're tracking the rat's position through the video camera. When the LEDs get close to the track, you can see the outline of the track along these walls. But if you can actually put uh, the video now, uh, Okay, let, let's forget about it. Um, there was some, uh, uh, the astronaut at the time was also taking part in an interview uh, and describing some of the phenomenon that I mentioned earlier. Uh, what you saw there was, uh, let me just stop for a second. T minus 10 seconds. Let me just actually, let, let me do that again so you can actually hear and I'll shut up for, for a short while. We just listen to the, the astronaut talking about his experience. In space and really the first 24 hours or so, I felt like I was standing on my head on Earth, where all the fluids shift from your lower extremities and your face feels very puffy and congested and you may have a mild headache with that as well. And it takes a few days for that to go away completely, but certainly it's very noticeable in the first 24 hours. The striking feature of getting around in space, to me it's very similar to being underwater. And if you scuba dive, you get very used to working upside down and right side up and you no longer have a true sense of upside down and right side up because you're used to working in the underwater environment. And to me, being in space is very much like being underwater, except I don't have to worry about all the equipment that normally you wear when you're scuba diving. So that was uh, another astronaut, uh, guy, uh, Dave Williams was a Canadian uh, astronaut doing uh, that interview while the other astronauts were doing an experiment. Here's what the cells look like. What you're seeing here is just a bunch of spikes or action potentials from the cells recording as the rat runs and does this task. Uh, and here you can see a little bit later on a different animal. You can see some more of the track here as, as the animal is uh, uh, running on the, on the track. Every so often the colored lights go out of view, but then they come back again. Uh, and here's the animal. He's going to start uh, walking up this wall here and then makes his, uh, the right turn uh, and walks along here, um, taking his time. And then over here, he's going to do something interesting. He's going to start looking at the parts of the environment off the track. And that's, uh, we're going to show you some interesting results from that uh, in a moment. But after a while, he's going to lose his grip. Play for that pop for PS1. PS1, there he go is. Ahead. He's, he's, he's off track now. He's exploring over here. It's like, come on, go, whoa. Just, uh, <laughs> heads up that your PAO is in about uh, 30 minutes. And at that time, but the nice astronaut caught him and puts him back on the track. Of, uh, but this is um, just to show this uh, really uh, was in zero G. We, we, this isn't the, the uh, something that I was making up here. Okay? In record mode. Uh, we believe they are, but just a friendly reminder. All right. So, so that was the experiment. And, and what did we find? So just to remind you, this is what the Escher staircase track looks like in the picture. And I'm going to show you these colored rate maps, we call them, like I showed you earlier, uh, which show where the cell liked to fire. So here's a cell that would fire strongly when the rat was on this part of the track, and but was silent elsewhere. So this particular cell looked just like a normal play cell, uh, just like we would record here in, in, on Earth. But this was actually uh, after many days of experience that the rat had in zero G. What we found is on the first time the rats experienced this environment, the place cell firing was completely disrupted. So flight day four, this is the fourth day of flight, as I mentioned before. Uh, this is the first time we had a chance that our experiment you know, got to the top of the list, and they recorded the animals. And here you can see that uh, there's all this red and green and blue, but it's dispersed all over the place. There's very little thing here that you would, looks like that really sharp firing field that shows specificity to one location. So uh, basically, it's like we thought might be the case, that when, when, when the rat could not keep track of where its motion was relative to all the landmarks there, the cells got confused and they stopped firing as the rat was doing these complicated three-dimensional movements. But when they record them again five days later, now suddenly things look a lot better. Now you, this is the cell I showed you before. It's firing nicely in this one location. Here's a cell that fell fires nicely here. You can see these nice hot spots of activity. They're not all perfect, but many more than before. So something has happened in that five days. The system has adapted to itself, or the rat has changed its strategy of how it keeps itself oriented, such that just like the astronauts, if you heard that, that clip from the astronaut saying, the first couple of days are really disturbing that the, he feels he's upside down, but he says it goes away over time. Well, we're finding the same thing here in the cells. They got better and better at keeping track of where the rat was as the rat got more experience in the weightless environment. 
And here's another uh, animal that we recorded from, which showed some similar things, but uh, a little more complicated, but quite interesting. You notice at the, at the last clip, I, when I said the, the, the rat kind of climbed off the track and started exploring the larger environment, well, that's what these cells here. A lot of cells fired selectively when the animal was doing that. But when the rat was actually moving along the track, three of these cells with these asterisks, these stars here, fired in three symmetric locations on the track. This is a case where the animal was doing the, the pitch movement, moving from one surface to the next uh, on all three surfaces, uh, as was this cell here. Uh, so this cell didn't seem to care about where the rat was, it seemed, at least in the environment, but it did care where the rat was on the track when it was making this pitch movement, moving from one surface to the next. And here's a cell that fired uh, at each of the uh, three yaw turns. I bring this out here because you never see that in a normal experiment here on Earth. The cells would choose to fire in one of these locations, never all three. It's as if the cell knows, okay, I'm supposed to fire when I make a right turn, but I can't distinguish this turn from that location, from that location, or here, here, or here. So again, there's this, this uh, disorientation phenomenon going on. But we, did, we didn't see that, in, again, in flight day nine. So even this rat uh, basically um, recalibrated itself or, or got used to the environment and the cells were, were, were normal, it's just like the astronauts. So the place cells appear to require either a period of adaptation to microgravity, zero G, or more experience in the environment. Uh, but we did see in, with experience, experience the uh, place fields eventually did become normal. And we think we explain this, this, this explains what happens in the, in, the, in the human hippocampus with the astronauts when they experience these orientation illusions and their, uh, their, their discomfort about feeling upside down, for example. And this was the first time that neurons like this were recorded in freely moving animals in the space shuttle environment, uh, basically showing that these are very complicated experiments. It took us years to prepare, and really this just shows that, uh, uh, that this kind of work can be done in that space shuttle environment, and something that NASA was very interested in as they go further and further trying to understand uh, how the human brain works in space. If there's ever this idea that people are gonna take very long-term trips to Mars or other places to, uh, uh, that we need to understand how the brain works and how, do, how does the brain develop and change uh, in, in that environment. So these are like, like a first step approach to that kind of work. So I'm gonna uh, wrap up now with a couple of slides to try to bring back, remember HM? I hope you all do. <laughs> <laughs> what does all this about dead reckoning and navigation and, and, and space rats and all, what's that got to do with Henry Molaison and memory? Well, I'm just gonna give you a couple of uh, 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 hints about that. Here's an experiment that we did in my lab a number of years ago, where I'm, going, I'm showing you five recording sessions, one after the other. And the first recording session was just like the ones I showed you earlier. It's just a rat running in an empty box. And here's a play cell that liked this location in the box. Just what O'Keefe described in the 1970s, a play cell. And the second session, we put an object in there I forget what it was, a bottle or a little toy or something like that. And the rats would still run around, they would sniff and explore this, but it didn't really affect the firing of the cell. Why should it? keep said they don't care about objects and toys, they care about place, man. But then this is what happened. On the third session, we took that object and moved it to a new location. Ah. It left a little place field behind. And then we move it in the fourth session to here. And now it's firing here and here and here. Actually, this field here actually shifted over a little bit to now fire where the object was here. And now we remove the object, and now the conditions are just like here. There's no longer any objects in here, but the cell's now firing at the three locations where the object used to be. This cell is basically somehow encoding the rat's memory of where it had experienced these objects before. So these cells are not just encoding place, where am I now? They seem to somehow encode the rat's memories of, of where it experienced objects before. Here's another experiment that we did. Uh, we had a rat running around a circular track. And here's the, the same kind of representation I showed you before. The black squiggles is the rat's trajectory as it ran about 15 laps around here. And the red dots are where the rat was when this one cell fired. And you look at it here, it looks just like a typical place field, just like I showed you up in space. But very interestingly, uh, when we looked at the firing of the cells lap by lap, 
from laps one, two, three, I'm sorry, the numbering got a little uh, mis uh, disrupted here, but this is lap one, two, three, four. You can see each lap. Uh, what Gita Rao and, and Joe Monaco in my lab found was that in the first four, five laps, the cell was silent. A couple of red spots here, but the cell really didn't care. It didn't, it didn't like any of the places on this track. But on lap six, the rat did something interesting. It stopped and did what we call this head scanning behavior. That's illustrated here. And, and rats do this. They'll stop, they'll go around, and they'll stop. Something catches their attention out there, and they look. They're trying to bring in information. What was that out there? Maybe it was the experiment. The, the rat's trying to find where's the next piece of chocolate going to be for me to find. But whatever it was caused this sort of fire really strongly. And then the rat said, okay, I'm going to keep moving. The very next lap, as the rat ran that location, the cell fired strongly. And on every single lap after that, it fired that location. And that's what created, created this place field here. So basically, we created, this cell was created somehow by whatever the rat was experiencing at that moment in time, created a new place field that kind of marks a memory, we think, of what the rat experienced there. In the way that's very reminiscent of what HM was missing, it, it, it was a one-shot event. It happened once, and somehow the cell has changed. It's created this new place field to form uh, some kind of a pointer or some kind of an index to whatever was happening there such that the rat could have a memory of whatever experience at that time. We don't know what the rat experienced. We didn't do a controlled experiment to find that out, but this is just highly suggestive of the kinds of changes in this map that happened with the experience that we think is involved in why the hippocampus is, is necessary for memory. It's not coincidental that in the earliest stages of Alzheimer's disease, when, Often, the, the, the most telling symptoms of that are memory loss and getting lost in familiar places. If anyone's seen this movie, Still Alice, a wonderful movie, uh, 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 Julianne Moore plays this woman who starts uh, uh, developing early onset Alzheimer's. She's a college professor, I think, in Columbia University. And one of the scenes early on is that she's leaving her office on this campus that she spent every day for the past 20 years, highly familiar, and she doesn't know where she is. She's lost, and she's panicking. If you're lost in an environment, it's very upsetting. It's very visceral. We've all had experiences, right? We, we suddenly don't know where we are. Even though, well, even though we know we're not in any danger, but we still feel anxious. Something's wrong about being lost. And that's what she was like. And this is in this movie, at least, you know, this was uh, one of the first signs that she started developing Alzheimer's disease. And of course, memory loss is the other uh, classic symptom where uh, people who are early stages of the disease, they keep asking the same question. And again, they'll have a conversation, they'll ask a question. And then five minutes later, they'll ask the same question. And five minutes later, the same question. They don't have any memory that they just asked that question five minutes ago. So, it also turns out, then, that the hippocampus and the areas nearby are the first parts of the brain that are affected by Alzheimer's disease. So there's no mystery now about why memory loss and being getting lost, being disoriented, are, are two symptoms, because this part of the brain, the hippocampus, is involved in both of these phenomena of the brain. Anyone's here a fan of Benedict Cumberbatch in the, the, the PBS movie Sherlock Holmes? Talk all the time about his memory, his mind palace. That's how Sherlock organizes information. He's got this incredibly elaborate palace in his head, and he stores information by knowing, remembering different locations in this palace and puts that information all together in his memory palace so he can retrieve it just by mentally walking through this palace and remembering the different pieces of information that he stored by it. This is a very famous mnemonic technique. Uh, uh, you know, centuries ago, people knew about it. It's called the method of loci is another terminology for this. A very st uh, strong, powerful technique for professional people who, 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 who compete in, in memory uh, competitions and all use. They, they associate uh, every arbitrary thing they want to remember with a location in a mental map they have of, 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 of their head. So another indication of the relationship between memory and spatial mapping and representations. So now these are the questions I told you I was going to uh, hopefully answer. Where in the brain does memory for the past events of your life reside? Answer, the hippocampus. Where in the brain does your sense of location and space, your inner GPS, reside? The answer? Yeah. There you go. What's the relationship between memory and your internal GPS, your cognitive map? Space and time are fundamental aspects of experience, existence. Every event occurs within a moment in space and in time. You can't get away from it. 
I didn't talk about time, but new research in the past 10 years has shown the hippocampus also encodes time, not just space. The brain knows this. It uses space and time as a framework to organize different aspects of an experience so they can be remembered. So you all have mental maps of where you are in this auditorium, and you're going to listen to me. This whole past hour, you've, you've watched me as I wave my arms around. You've seen the videos here. You've heard my voice. You've been thinking, what is he talking about? All this kind of stuff, the idea is that gets organized and brought into the hippocampus and bound together on this space, this spatial framework, this cognitive map, in a way that you can put it all together. And if later on you want to remember what you heard here tonight, your brain activates your map of where you were. And that activates the parts of your brain that encoded the visual experience, the auditory experience, your thoughts, your feelings. It's all tied together. And that's what that tying together in the, on the map is what allows you to then retrieve it and relive, re-experience the events because it got bound together. It's like an index code is what the, the spatial map appears to be doing for all the different parts of your brain that are part of an experience. That, that encode parts of the experience. So the mind palace technique, this method of loci, works so well because it takes advantage of the brain's natural method to store memories. Again, it's not coincidental that this spatial mnemonic technique works so well because it's, that, that's how the brain naturally does it. And the loss of the cognitive map causes spatial disorientation and memory loss. Again, uh, it's showing the fundamental relationship between these two different things. So I just want to close with this slide here. You know, we do basic neuroscience research, and you know, not just because it's fun and interesting and all, which it is, but we hope to understand the brain mechanisms that underlie normal, normal memory function and retrieval. It not only contributes to our understanding of you know, the, quote, the human condition, what is it that makes us who we are? A large part of our sense of self, of who we are, is based on our memories. And we want to know, how does that work? How does the brain do that? Just a fundamentally interesting, intriguing scientific question to understand. The philosophers for centuries were asking this question. It goes back to Aristotle before that. But not only that, it also holds promise for understanding and finding treatments for the devastating neurological disorders that rob individuals of their memory. So we hope that by doing this kind of work, we can understand the basic biology of how, how memory works and, and hopefully uh, uh, you know, down the road gets an inkling about how to treat uh, these devastating disorders. So I'll just finish up the, the people who funded our work, National Institute of Health and NASA for this project. And I was at the University of Arizona when I was a postdoctoral fellow starting the NASA work and continued that at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston, as Mike mentioned, and now I'm at Johns Hopkins. So uh, with that, thank you for your attention. OK. So we're going to assemble our uh, panel of experts. I'll introduce them, and we can start asking questions. Elena's going to show us our, here we go. So while we're doing this, I, I, I wanted to wait till now to do our thank yous, but this is Elena Silva, and she puts all this together, so please help me thank her. <laughs> you, you probably saw uh, the people in the UT Brainstorms t-shirts. That's our, our, our army of volunteers from St. Edwards University, so thank you for them, too. So, uh, 21st century approach then is that if you, if, you, if you text that number right there, that you can see all but one, uh, no, there we go. Um, those questions will appear on these computers over here for our panel and they'll be picking out the best ones. They'll, they'll star the, their favorite ones which will send them over here to Elena and then when I give, hit her with my elbow, they'll pop on the screen <laughs> and they'll ask her. So, your alternative then is that you can come to the microphones and ask a question the, uh, uh, what's that, uh, with your voice, yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, thank you to Jim. You can, see, you can see why I was excited to invite him. So our panelists tonight, whoop. You can log in here. No. <laughs> your password. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, our panelists tonight, so uh, this is Dr. Michael Drew from the Department of Neuroscience at UT. Um, Last year or two years ago? Michael's done brainstorms before, and you're doing in the fall, in the spring sometime. I am? Yeah, well, you'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> this is um, Kate Sherry. 
She's a, she's a postdoc fellow with Allie Preston. You're, if you, uh, Allie was one of our fun speakers from last year. She studies memory and formerly navigation in humans. And this is Hannah, Hannah Room. She's also a postdoc in the same lab. The two of them use a functional image to study these imaging to study these sorts of things in humans. So we've got uh, Jim and Michael, the, the animal researchers. We've got the human people. And I'm just here to call on people and keep things going, OK? I know, human people, that's a stupid thing to say. So let's see. Uh, uh, you want to start us off, please? Sure. Uh, it seems to me there's been a drastic recent change in how we navigate in our mundane daily way driving. We don't really use our eyes. We use our phones and our ears. And I wondered if there's any research in how and it, it was interesting how adaptive the brain was with the astronauts and even the rats in space. And I wonder if there's research into how we're adapting to the addition of radical technology to processing navigation, memory, things like that. Yeah. So I can talk to the developmental literature. So I can talk about children and the effect of technology and their understanding of spatial memory. Um, so we run a series of questions and we ask them whether they listen to GPS directions or we ask them what video games that they play. Um, and there are genres of video games, there are those children that do listen or don't listen or are actively involved in the technology and you can see differences in their spatial memory. But equally you can they're called intervention studies of which you can also train people to reach the level of those that play video games regularly or that involve with GPS directions regularly. So I can't necessarily talk to its impact on everyday life, but I can certainly say that there is this, whether it's implicit or explicit, um, kind of exposure to the technology, it does impact um, the way that you move around the world and the building of that map around the world. Very good. So we'll, we'll take our cue from that. Uh, it, that was great. It always works best when we keep our uh, questions kind of short and focused, just like the answers. And that way we can get to lots of questions. So uh, you're up. Uh, thank you. Uh, so we work in teaching uh, memory techniques using the latest in neuroscience. And we've come up with a very interesting thing. I'm sure you guys have heard the study of the taxi drivers uh, with their hippocampuses having increased volume or just a little bit bigger. And so we took that to the next level, and we're teaching memory techniques of two dimensions of people memorizing maps, fine, and then three dimension of just three-dimensional static space. But when we get to the fourth dimension, over 90% of the trial students experience headaches and are reporting headaches. So I would love, and by the way, thanks for coming, uh, love the, the theory you may have on why we're coming across this at, at such a high degree. Uh, maybe their hippocampus is getting too big. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, we integrate, uh, the fourth dimension is the fact that now they're memorizing maps that change in time, like you were uh, talking about. That fourth dimension is where it starts to, and from kids to adults to everyone we've had in our, in our control, um, they're all reporting headaches when they have to start memorizing a, what we call 4D memory, which is what we're trying to teach and unlock. Have you checked that it's not just a, a load issue that, you know, yeah. I, yeah. Okay. We, so you're controlling for that. Yeah. We we've we've taught in different times of day, and uh -huh. we've introduced it at different uh, like uh, after different uh, event related potentials and and protocols, and like even after seeing a fun movie or something like that, and we and we get it across the board. They get headaches, and so we want to push this forward, and we know the benefits of it. But the headache thing, we'd love to know where it's coming from, or where just a theory besides our own. I, I don't really have one for you, unfortunately, uh, other than to say that uh, it's only in recent years, as I mentioned, that we're starting to appreciate the time dimension in this whole system, and a lot of work is being done to understand that. I'm happy to talk afterwards if you want, but I, I don't have any words of wisdom <laughs> to, to, to give the whole audience on this, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you. Will you try? Um, my question is about as we move beyond Earth, 
you know, we're starting to entertain the thoughts of interplanetary travel or deep space. Um, um, now we're introducing a radiation environment that can interfere with our brain. Have you done any, seen any studies of what happens to our sense of place when we get zapped all the time? <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, you know, one of the topics that I work on is uh, adult neurogenesis. And so, uh, hippocampus, uh, you know, in, in, in addition to doing these interesting memory functions, happens to be one of the small number of areas of your brain that continues to generate new neurons throughout your life, uh, even, you know, in late, even as we get older. Um, and it also happens to be the case that, you know, there are stem cells in your hippocampus, that's, that's what produces these neurons, and they're very sensitive to radiation. And uh, so when you go out into space, you're getting exposed to high levels of uh, different sources of radiation. And it looks like um, if there's not proper shielding, that can actually damage the stem cells. Uh, and so one of the things, so there are actually people who are, are looking at the effects of these different sorts of uh, of uh, space irradiation on, on, on neurogenesis. And it does look like it, it does kill off some of those stem cells. And so if you've got a cancerous tumor, it'd be great to go out into space, right? It would kill off your tumor, but it might also uh, uh, affect the neurogenesis that that's ongoing in your hippocampus, and we think that that could actually uh, cause memory impairments. Important safety tip, yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> Um, going to the uh, mention that you made about time in the hippocampus and how it encodes time, uh, did anyone uh, go, when HM was still alive, did anyone interview him extensively to try to get a sense of how the passage of time affected or did not affect him? Like, did he still mentally perceive himself as the 20-year-old before the surgery or ever develop a sense of, oh, I'm old now? Yeah, a uh, fascinating question. And the answer is kind of halfway in between both of those. So um, yeah, you, you can imagine, right? He was in his 80s when he, he died. And every time he looked in the mirror, did he, he perceive himself as a 26-year-old man and this old man was looking back at him? Uh, so um, my understanding is from, from reading and talking to people is that he had this general, he knew he had a bad memory, and he would always say, he would always be apologizing to people, oh, I've got, you know, I've got memory problems and all. So he knew he had a condition, he knew things overall were happening, so there are many different parts of the brain involved in memory, um, and there was certainly parts of his brain were still functioning that over a very long period of time, he had this general knowledge of himself as being an older man, uh, yet still had, but, but, but couldn't tell you any experiences that he lived on his way towards becoming an older man. Uh, I don't know much about time perception itself. I don't know if that was, uh, maybe you might know whether they, uh, in the, back then they tested his time perception. But again, there are many different parts of the brain uh, in, that encode time, including the work that Mike does in, in the cerebellum, a, a different part of the brain. So uh, it's a complicated thing. And, and at the time, we didn't quite appreciate how important time was to the hippocampus then, so I don't think they really did much effort, uh, much, much work on that. Great. Thanks. Great question. So, ladies and gentlemen, UT Brainstorms now joins the 21st century and panel. Here's our question right here from, uh, from the, from the uh, atmosphere. So, are there brain exercises to maintain memory and spatial abilities? And how does one sign up for them? <laughs> Yeah, so I picked this question because um, there's a really interesting group out of London that created an app that they put on the iTunes store, and it's called Sea Hero Quest. Um, and they worked with video game developers to create this uh, video game, and they had, I think it's around 4 million people uh, download the app and collect data from it. And what they did is they showed people maps of uh, you know where they were going to be placed in this beautiful beautiful environment, where their goal was, then they took the map away and they had to go and navigate themselves. And um, what they could use this app for is kind of a way to look across generations globally, um, what are navigational techniques that are kind of markers of, of good navigators that potentially could be a way to um, also give indications of whether or not they would be um, deterministic of 
early onset Alzheimer's as well. And so the unfortunate thing is I went today to go see if I could download See Hero Quest, and we can't get it in the US anymore. It's just in the UK. Um, yeah, Hannah's, <laughs> Hannah's British. Um, but I think that there is this push generally to try and um, kind of reach the masses in ways that we can exercise our brain. Um, I think one of the things in terms of navigation as well is we are now so connected to our phones and our GPS and you just blindly follow what your phone tells you to do and we all hear those horror stories of people that just make, you know, turn onto a railroad track because my phone told me to turn left. <laughs> um, but getting out and actually exploring um, a little bit, you know, we all have our kind of standard routes that we follow to our home um, and our place of work where we park our car and getting out. And there's been some work out of NYU too where they had people again download an app um, linked with their GPS and what they found is that as people perform their daily lives they would ask some questions about like how do you feel right now and what they found is as they explored their environment more they responded with more positive affect so it's not just perhaps that um, you can improve your spatial ability by exploration just even like going a different way to your office or you know, going a different way to the grocery store, but potentially it could even improve like how you feel about life because you might find something new or, um, yeah, there's just potential benefits to exploring your environment more and more. Yes. Um, th this, this whole presentation is just mind blowing, pardon the pun, <laughs> but um, <laughs> it, it got me thinking about potentially a case study that y'all can do with, um, I don't know if y'all have seen uh, Fortnite at all. <laughs> Bear with me. <laughs> um, you know, Fortnite has one standard map that everyone spawns into. So it'd be really interesting to see if you could do a poll or an interview to get an idea of how people perceive the map changing from season to season. Because since the advent of season two, uh, developer Epic has implemented new different ways people can navigate and transfer through the map. So you have this giant you know, uh, collection of information of people playing the game, hundreds of millions of people. It'd be fascinating to see if there would be a way to tap into how players perceive the map changing and whether you can get an indication that that also affects your spatial memory. Yeah, I can speak a little bit to that. Um, so very much as Jim was speaking about the electrode recordings within rodents, mm -hmm. um, we actually work with the Dell Medical Center to um, work with patients that have epilepsy where they have electrodes implanted into parts of their brain where potentially the ep epilepsy is um, coming from. Mm -hmm. And so while they're sitting in the hospital, we have a unique opportunity to go and work with them um, and get the neural recordings within their brain while they're just sitting there waiting um, to have further procedures. And one of the things that we put together really quickly, <laughs> in fact, is to have them play Fortnite. So uh, <laughs> there we have a potential to look at actual neural recordings of these patients um, they're just bored while they're in the hospital, so we figured they might as well play a video game with some of these spatial aspects. So it wouldn't be a large population, but potentially you could have people that either have video game experience or don't, or a lot of different variety things. Hello, I just want to say hi to Dr. Drew and Dr. Mock. I don't know if you remember me. Yeah. I was a previous student of yours. And um, so I just wanted to ask if... Uh, I'm, I'm not going to change your grade. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, we can talk about this. <laughs> I just wanted to ask if um, there were any tests with hallucinogens and how that played an effect with spatial memory and stuff like that. Mm. Mm. Uh, yeah. uh, Are you accusing us of something? <laughs> uh, allegedly. Yeah, I, yeah I, I don't know of any. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know of any work on um, hippocampus and hallucinogens and spatial memory. And there's a lot of interesting work now going on on hallucinogens and 
uh, you know, an, you know, antidepressant effects and anxiolytic effects. Um, but I am not aware of any work on hippocampus. It's a, actually a really good question. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, okay. So, to my current knowledge, um, I was very curious about how the spatial awareness in cells relates to long-term memory with the rats in your experiment. To, I understand that learning, any sort of long-term encoding requires effortful um, learning, basically, so getting lost, for instance. So I was wondering if your experiment looks into any sort of long-term yeah. encoding and how we can like relate this back to the real life as well. So um, it's true that certain kinds of learning require effort. Uh, the typical things that you talk about in school, having you know, to study for a test and so forth, and uh, having being active and so forth uh, is important to, to make a long-term memory. Um, but the kinds of memory that we think the hippocampus is specific for isn't actually that kind of memory. So um, it's what they call the episodic memory. These are memories that just happen. You know, the, the experience of your life, like, it's not like studying for a test where you, you, you want to memorize and repeat over and over again so you finally burn it inside. Uh, episodes in one's life, they just happen and that's it. You don't get to, you, you're not going to, luckily for you, you're not going to have to hear me talk ten times now <laughs> before you remember this. You know, this, this, you're either going to remember it or not. Now, there are ways that the brain has to, after the fact, kind of burn these memories in, but these, we think these tend to happen actually during sleep or other periods in your life where you're actually not actively processing things. So there are different kinds of memory systems. Uh, they're related to each other, uh, and, but, it's, it's, but in ways that we don't really understand well, and it's a, it, it's a very active uh, a part of research. Uh, so that's a general answer, but, but I will say though, because this is actually one of, the, one of the questions that came online related to this, they asked when I showed you the cells that seem to remember the location of the objects, um, how long that lasted. We didn't test that in my lab, but other labs have shown similar things, and they've shown that those memories can last for a month or more. Um, so the, the rat had one experience of moving that object, but for a month or more, there was evidence that those cells still maintain that memory. You know, in the, in the life of a rat, that's a pretty, that's a pretty long time. So, so there's something about these memories that, uh, that happen once, and they can be very long-lasting. Uh, and then there's another, episode, another question about the uh, flashbulb memories, like remembering where you were when, JF, when you learned JFK got shot. Emotional experiences have something about that that, that, that really help the, the cellular mechanisms that really burn a memory into the brain. So there's a lot of things like that, but it, it, these are all great questions because they're, they're, they're the kinds of questions that we've been trying to understand for a long time now. And we're you know, making progress, but there's a, lot, a long way to go. Yeah, just to add to that, going back to the, there's a, that's quite a key part of the episodic development literature. So you look at the duration to which a child can hold an experience or an event, and you can watch that trajectory. But it's, I mean, they can hold a, a memory for, they've just experienced once for at least a day, and you can, you can track the forgetting, and it, that's really, really part of how children, like, strengthen that memory and through sleep. Like, when we tell you to don't stay up all night, like sleep on it, sleep on it. It makes a huge difference. And you can see that in children, especially bringing it back to spatial memory, that they will um, do uh, like a circular arena, like here where they have to, they're in sandboxes and they have to find those items that they've hidden. And the way that they behave immediately versus the way they behave after 12 hours sleep is incredible, where they start to look like adults, and you can start to see how they're forming this memory of where they are and where things are in their environment. Yeah, I could just add one thing to that. Yeah, I think one of the really uh, interesting ideas about, you know, so the, so the question is, um, you know, hippocampus is special because it can do this one trial learning. You know, you just need to have an episode once to remember it, whereas the other regions of our brain that do memory, like our striatum and our cerebellum and our neocortex, they, were, they can't do one trial learning. They need many trials. And so why does the hippocampus, why is it able to do one trial learning? And one of the, this isn't the only idea, but one of the ideas is that 
Hippocampus can actually turn one trial into many trials because it actually replays during periods of rest and periods of sleep, it actually replays experiences over and over again. And, uh, and you can see that in the kinds of recordings that Jim does. And so that, that's, so it actually turns, our hippocampus turns one trial and actually in practices and turns into many trials. And you need rest and sleep in order to do that. All right, okay, Thank panel. you so much. Oops, sorry. From the, from the text then, what are the best ways to strengthen and develop the hippocampus in children and teens? Well, there are, there are kind of two parts to this, I think. I think we can think of the development of the hippocampus itself and, and what is believed um, to be happening during development. Um, then there's the part of whether we can strengthen this, and I think that's a whole different debate. Um, and the evidence out there, certainly behaviorally at least, um, and there is starting to look at stuff in terms of intervention studies like I mentioned before, but I, it's very mixed and whether this is possible even to do so. But the, the hippocampus is pretty phenomenal in terms of, so as a child you think you, you form an episodic memory at approximately the age of two years old, and it was thought that the hippocampus was fully developed by five years. But that does not seem to be the case at all. So there are these very subtle differences um, as you go from the anterior of the hippocampus to the posterior and how they develop differently and the different functions that they then provide. So as a, as a child, what we like to do is we keep everything very separate. We're learning tons of information in school where we are building our maps of our world and building up our knowledge to use it. Um, and that's related to a specific part of the hippocampus, the posterior hippocampus. But then as we get older, we start to generalize that information. So we are able to like combine events that we've experienced. And that's thought to move into the anterior hippocampus, and which has got a much like, a, well, a longer developmental trajectory. But then even then with the hippocampus, it's connectivity to the prefrontal cortex. So that's got an even longer trajectory till about the age of 25. So, and it's building up all these different connections and really thinking about like how we are storing that information, but then how we use that information. Because a lot of the time kids have that information, they just don't know how to access it. So it takes a context, it takes a location and bringing them back to where they were to then help bring, reactivate that memory for them to use. And puberty is like huge. Whether we should be even thinking about chronological age, we should actually be looking at puberty as a way to scale people and how that has impacts on the hippocampus and connectivity and where we're using it. Um, to bring it back to the strengthening, like uh, there is things called cognitive training studies that are out there, um, but it's querying. So we can, supposedly you can train the brain to do something really, really well, but it's very specific to that task. So then the, the transfer of that and the durability and the length to which you can see that is debated. Um, and it links also back to neurogenesis, which was being spoken about before. So it's very early stages and it's very, very mixed and it's very specific. So just keep doing what you're doing and All right. it just takes a long time. <laughs> Speaking a long time. Um, so I, I am now uh, activating lightning around. So uh, panel, you've got 20 seconds to answer every question from here on out, okay? I don't have a gong, but uh, I'll think of something. So please, start us off. So I was wondering how a positional or a locational memory related to facial recognition or recognition of objects. So there has been a little bit of work in, um, was it in rodents or humans? The facial configuration yeah. in humans. Humans. Okay. So in humans, where the same coding um, of a metric of space that Jim talked about, the grid cells, that your gaze movements, your eye movements, also have this same hexadirectional coding. Um, and so that potentially, as we look at people's faces, you start with the eyes, and then maybe you move to the nose, and that's how you're able to discern my face from Hannah's face. Um, and that our brain kind of processes visual scenes in this same structured manner in order to organize what you're viewing. Thank 
curious if uh, the brain kind of handles the organization of different sense input, so sight versus sound, um, and like the same, does it all get filtered to the same place, or is that kind of a different process, or how does that work? So the sensory components of it are done in different brain areas. The back of your brain does vision, the side of the brain audition, the bottom of the brain olfaction. But all that information gets funneled into the hippocampus where it's all combined. And that's what we think that's what the hippocampus does. It's in a unique location to get all this primary sensory information, put it all together to bind it so you can then recreate the memory. Something like that with pretty confidence going on. Um, so back to your um, statement about how like uh, the rats could remember for like four or five months afterwards. Um, could you kind of explain deja vu in the sense that like, hey, it's a memory that's like a fragile memory that's not like quite ossified, like not like a light bulb memory. So then you're like, okay, I'm gonna go to here, and then you know, oh wait, I've already been here, but I don't know, you know, things like that. <laughs> you wanna Everybody so. knows deja vu is when they reset the matrix. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the way that Kate and I at least think about this in terms of the reactivation of memories, it's like part of like if it's like a fragile recollection or a partial reactivation of that memory where if you think of you might have one cue and you're just not able to fully reconstruct it and also it's been a spontaneous cue that's given you that. So it possibly isn't the same thing that's usually going to make you feel that that location and that space, but you've still, your hippocampus has still reactivated part of this that makes you feel that you are in that location or you have felt this feeling or that, you know, you've done this action before. Okay. So panel, is the hippocampus the highest hierarchically in any way area of the brain in terms of information processing? No. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, on the, when you had the rats up there and you were showing that you're hearing these pops and pulses uh, when they recognize something, is that phenomena happening across the entire brain where, you know, not just a small area that you were measuring, but the entire creature's brain was having these pulses all the time? Absolutely, that, that's how the brain works. It, it, the, those pulses is just the electrical signals of one brain cell communicating with another brain cell. And, 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 and that's what the brain is. It's just a, this electrical device and somehow similar to a computer, which is what Mike gave it, brainstorms on this a couple of years ago, uh, that, that you know, if, if you think about the brain as being a computer and the brain cells are little transistors and these pops is just these transistors talking to each other and doing the computation that is going on inside the head. Is it AC or DC? Ah, that's actually a good question. <laughs> Mostly DC, we think. Cool. How does the exposure of, to technology positively and negatively affect memory slash location? Yeah, I guess I was kind of speaking to this same question earlier. Um, so we're, we're still looking into this. We, whenever people come in to do experiments in our lab, we always ask them about their video game exposure, um, GPS, as Hannah mentioned earlier, and we don't necessarily have all the answers yet, but I think that kind of what I was poking at a little bit earlier is just potentially being more aware of your surroundings um, is a good way to think about it, kind of in similar ways that we talk about uh, strengthening your performance in memory um, by trying new and different techniques um, to strengthen your memory, right? So don't just do the crossword puzzle, but try Sudoku and all these other different things and exercise your brain. It's like exercise your spatial abilities as well, explore your environment, and potentially be a better navigator. Okay. We're going to end with you three. If you can frame your questions so they can answer in a sentence or two, then this, we will call this hyper-lightning round. And then we'll finish, so challenge them. Yeah, so uh, it seems that we are hardwired to learn how to navigate in a certain way. Uh, my first question, is it the optimal and uh, the most effective way to learn how to navigate? And if so, should we uh, teach, like uh, now we are building robots and self-driving cars, uh, should, we, uh, should the, the, these self-driving cars learn in the same way um, how to navigate? Like, 
creating a grid like in a hexagonal way or uh, having uh, some uh, points in the, the, the space where, um, yeah, like uh, from our understanding of how we navigate, should we teach robots and cars to, to navigate the same way or there is a better way to do it? Um, so in working with humans and building cognitive maps of their experience, um, both in spatial environments and in other um, types of domains, uh, people learn how to navigate in very, very different ways. And I would not say that there is one optimal way. We have these same neural structures across all of our minds, but how we use those in order to understand our environment is very different. And so I wouldn't say that there is a specific way. Definitely cars should not try one way. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> but um, we navigate differently but that doesn't necessarily make us better or worse navigators. Okay, thank you. Cars have a GPS, yeah. they're, they're, I think they're good. So, number two. Yeah, so with memory being such a big part of the human experience and like a learning development, is messing with the hippocampus affect like personality as well? Good question. Oh, jeez. <laughs> That's um, punishment for the smart aleck comments you're making. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, I'm going to have to just spitball on this one, but I would say, um, well, we know that certain parts of the hippocampus are involved in sort of emotional regulation, which I think is part of, you know, in our, our, our predisposition to feel anxious, for instance, uh, maybe even mood. And so my guess would be yes, although I don't know, for instance, I don't know if we know how it affected HM's personality, for instance. Well, the reports are actually that it, 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 pro it didn't seem to affect his personality very much. If anyone's interested in HM, there's a wonderful book called Permanent Present Tense uh, by Suzanne Corkin, who was the researcher who spent her whole career studying HM. Mm. And it's a very readable book for, and, and it's, it's just fascinating. So if this topic interests you, I would highly recommend it. Mm. But in that book, you know, they do say actually his, 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 his personality really did not seem to be affected all that much. So it's, which is really interesting. Like I said, uh, uh, since memory is such a large part of one's self perception, but, uh, so. But on the other hand, when we, when we like lesion the hippocampus in rodents, it, it kind of does change the personality. Yeah. All right, thank you. Great question, thank you. Last question, thank you. Um, so I was wondering, uh, when we sleep, for instance, we can feel a sense of falling. So I was wondering if the hippocampus plays a role in that sensation. <laughs> <laughs> not that I'm aware of. I, I, I don't, not, yeah, I, I've, I've never heard any evidence that would suggest that. Sleep is another complicated thing. <laughs> Maybe sleep on the bottom bunk. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, thank you so much. Will you please uh, thank our panel? And Thanks to Michael, Kate, and Hannah, and special thanks to my old friend Jim Kinnearum for coming all the way from Hopkins. And, and thank you for coming. We appreciate it. Uh, I can just end with this. If you had fun tonight, the, the, the kindest way that you can thank us is tell your friends and bring a few of them when you come back next time. Uh, there's eight more next times this year, so uh, we hope to see you again. Please be safe. <laughs>